There's another train. There always is. No matter how much we think we've done something irrevocable, usually there's another opportunity. You know, people keep asking me whether I've made my New Year's resolutions yet. And I keep saying, well, no, not yet, but I I'm going to get around to that, which may point to one resolution I ought to make. But given that I haven't yet sent my Christmas cards either, um, making a resolution to stop procrastinating is probably a lost cause. <laughs> I have a real love-hate relationship with New Year's resolutions. Maybe some of you share this with me. So far, I have made only one this year, and it has to do with keeping my side of the bathroom counter free of clutter. <laughs> I realize this is not an earth-shaking personal change to make, but it's one small thing I thought perhaps I could actually achieve that would make my spouse happy. And it's good, after all, to set realistic goals in our lives. We are almost two weeks into the new year, and so far I have managed to keep this resolution. <laughs> Part of me thinks it's really great that we have this time of year designed to help us stop and take stock of our lives. What have I done well this year? What would I like to be doing differently? How well is my life really reflecting the qualities that I want it to reflect? Being thoughtful and intentional about that kind of self-examination has the potential to be really helpful. But that's not the way that most of us go at it. Most New Year's resolutions take a much more judgmental tone than that. When I start thinking about resolutions, I don't think, how could I become more fully the person I'm really meant to be? What I think is, okay, what's wrong with me that needs to be fixed? It's not that I mind admitting that there are indeed things wrong with me that need to be fixed. We all have room for improvement, shall we say. We all have things we would like to tweak, things we think we could do better. But taking a judgmental approach to our New Year's resolutions often leaves us feeling ashamed of the things that we're trying to change, the things we think are wrong with us, that we ought to be able somehow just by summoning up the power of our will and making a decision about it to fix all those things that are wrong. So once a year on January 1st, or shortly thereafter, for those of us who put things off, our whole culture goes through this short-lived commitment to perfection. Suddenly we're determined to achieve the perfect weight, the perfect relationship, the perfect job, the perfect exercise program. It's as though the new year gives us this chance to put on some other identity than our own. That was then, this is now. Then I was flawed, now I will be perfect. I have heard it said that trying to be perfect is the most tragic human mistake. I believe this to be true. It's a tragic mistake to try to be perfect because it's utterly impossible to achieve. And so we automatically set ourselves up for failure. A friend of mine refers to putting that kind of pressure on ourselves as doing violence to our souls. So I am here to tell you that you should not try to be perfect. But at the same time, this is not one of those, I'm okay, you're okay, we can all just be however we want to be and everybody else has to accept us because that's just who we are, sermons either. <coughs> The word should and ought, those two words, have gotten a bad reputation in our culture lately. Contemporary psychology will say that one should never direct the word should or ought at oneself because they imply judgment and a lack of self-acceptance. I should do this, I ought to do that. I had a friend who would say to me when I, when I would say, oh, I should be doing, I should, she would say, don't should on yourself. <laughs> Perhaps some of you have heard that expression. But I think that should and ought are very important and useful words. Sometimes we know at the deepest part of who we are that we should or ought 
to be doing something different than we are, that we're going away from who we really want to be, and we need to be called back. I like to think of the cosmic ought as opposed to the judging ought. You know, the cosmic ought is the one that, that speaks from inside my soul as opposed to the judgment that comes from some outside voice. I think it's really important to evaluate and to reassess our lives. If we overdo it, if we do nothing but should and ought ourselves, we can become paralyzed. But surely some of the time, we need to be reflecting on who we really feel we're meant to be and how we can move closer to being more of that person. So this isn't a sermon against, revel against resolutions or against self-evaluation or against trying to change ourselves for the better. It's a sermon about trying to strike a different kind of balance in how we do it. Because the danger lies in taking an all or nothing kind of approach. It's very easy to fall into dualistic thinking so that either I'm exactly right or if I'm not exactly right, then I must be absolutely wrong. If the dinner wasn't perfect, then the evening must have been a disaster. If I lose my temper once and yell at my child, then I must be a terrible parent. Many of us have this tendency to assume that any time we fall short of an ideal, we failed in some irrevocable way. I have a dear friend who is constantly telling me I am the world's worst mother. She's saying this about herself. And she means it every time she says it, and you can tell it's just cutting her heart into pieces to feel that way. And she's a great mother. And like every great mother, she makes mistakes sometimes. She's not a perfect mother. She makes mistakes. And every time she falls short of her image of maternal perfection, then she beats herself up because there seems to be no middle ground. We set ourselves up for that kind of failure every time we ask the impossible of ourselves. So think about those resolutions. This year, I will lose 25 pounds, I will quit smoking, I will be a better parent, I will work out three times a week, I will finish my doctorate, I will grow my own organic vegetables, I will write in my journal every day, and I'll make more time for myself. <laughs> now those may not be the specific items on any of your lists, but I've made lists that sounded kind of like that. Maybe some of you have too. Talk about a setup for failure. To err is human, the saying goes. And I came across a wonderful paragraph from Francis T. Vincent Jr. Do some of you know who he is? Who he was? He was commissioner of baseball from 1989 to 1992, for all you baseball fans. And Francis Vincent Jr. said this. Baseball teaches us, or has taught most of us, how to deal with failure. We learn at a very young age that failure is the norm in baseball. And precisely because we have failed, we hold in high regard those who fail less often. <laughs> those who hit safely in one out of three chances and become star players. I also find it fascinating, he goes on, that baseball alone in sport considers errors to be part of the game, part of its rigorous truth. It had never occurred to me before that when you go, wow, he's batting 300. That means he's getting one hit out of three. Mm -hmm. If my sermons were only one hit out of three, <laughs> Kent probably wouldn't have invited me to be here this morning. If you only succeeded one time out of three at whatever kind of work you do, you might be having some interesting conversations with your supervisor. <laughs> so maybe if one in three is enough to get you star billing, some of us have a better chance than we thought. But what I really love in this quotation from Mr. Vincent is the observation that errors are part of the game. It's so absolutely assumed that baseball players will make errors 
that errors are factored into the way the official scoring of the game. It's a category in your score. Errors are part of the game, part of its rigorous truth, and that's not only true in baseball. Now, Unitarian Universalists long ago rejected the doctrine of human depravity, this idea that human beings are inherently worthless, sinful, utterly depraved. Early in our history, we insisted on a much more optimistic view of human nature. If you're convinced of your own utter depravity, well, that's paralyzing. If our nature is utterly depraved, then why would we ever bother trying to do better? It would be hopeless. So I am delighted that we threw that concept away. The trouble is, when we threw away the doctrine of human depravity, we replaced it with a doctrine of human perfectibility. And that, in my mind, is just as paralyzing. Because we are not perfectible. We're improvable, but we're not perfectible. Errors will always be part of our game. The reality of human existence is that we are a paradox. We're this blend, always, of wisdom and foolishness, right and wrong, good and bad. There's a proverb from Hasidic Judaism that I love that says we should each have two slips of paper, one in each pocket, that we can pull out and read whenever we need them. And one of these slips of paper says, for you the universe was made. And the other slip of paper says, you are made of dust and ashes. And they're both true. So if we're not striving for perfection, then what are we after? I'm almost afraid to talk about excellence. It's become such a buzzword, and it's often very poorly defined. And after the first service, someone said to me, you know, I just can't even go there with that word excellence, because it gets used too much like the word perfection. She said, I'm, I'm working with good enough. <laughs> and that works for me, too. Good enough doesn't mean necessarily low standards. You can have a very high standard of what's good enough. But when you reach it, then you say, OK, it's good enough. I'm going to rest now. So you can choose your language accordingly. But I'm going to stick with the excellence versus perfection simply because that's the way I originally set this up. Excellence is a very different kind of goal than perfection. Perfection doesn't leave any room for error. Excellence allows us to accommodate error, to incorporate our errors and learn from them. That's part of what I understand excellence to be. Accepting ourselves doesn't mean that we stop trying to improve ourselves, but it means that we start by accepting the reality of our human imperfections and then see what we can do with that. And I think acceptance goes a bit beyond that too, because imperfection isn't just something that we have to accept because we're stuck with it. It's one of the wonderful things about being human. It's our imperfection that makes us humble, that helps us be open and vulnerable enough to love and sympathize with and understand and support each other. If we can see the actual value of our imperfection, then it becomes easier to examine our lives with gentle suggestions for improvement rather than with judgment for our failings. If we strive for perfection, any time we fall short, we failed. We're not perfect, we failed. It's an all or nothing proposition. But if we begin by accepting the reality of our human imperfection, if we strive for excellence, if we fall short, we've fallen short. That's not failure. It's just not, not getting quite as far as we'd hope to get. It happens all the time. It's like that saying you see on t-shirts that say, you know, the ones that say, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. But we can get up. We do get up. That's the glory of being human. We keep falling down and we keep getting back up again. The fact is falling down 
is a fundamental part of the human experience. It's not just that we try to learn from our mistakes because we're stuck with them. It's the realization that we actually need those mistakes in order to do our learning, that the mistakes are valuable. If we don't make mistakes and take risks and occasionally perhaps fall flat on our faces, we never get anywhere. Excellence allows us to take risks. Perfection keeps us afraid of taking risks. I had a piano teacher when I was in high school who never had much to say if I made it all the way through a piece without making a mistake. He'd just kind of nod his head and go on to the next piece. But if I made a mistake and then recovered from it well, he was full of praise. He encouraged me to play adventurously and then cope with the mistakes that would result rather than to play cautiously and never make any mistakes. Along the same lines, I heard an interview with Stephen Sondheim on NPR years ago. And Sondheim was talking about how much he had learned from Richard Rogers, working in musical theater. And one of the most important things he had learned was to take big risks. Give it everything you've got and don't be afraid of failing. If you do flop, and Rogers did occasionally flop on as, on as grand a scale as he often succeeded, if you do flop, it's not worth getting embarrassed about. You just pick yourself up and dust yourself off, learn what you can from it, and try something else. Excellence leaves room for those kinds of failures. Perfection doesn't. Sometimes it's precisely in our mistakes that we do the most good. Some of the most important ministry takes place in the moments when we fall flat on our faces. And I'm sure some of you have had this experience too. I am pleased to announce to you that this is not limited to the professional ministry. Each one of you has the potential to minister to others through your own failings. Because most people can relate better to us in our struggles than they can in our triumphs. The whole philosophy of 12-step programs, for example, is grounded in the belief that we can do more for each other when we share from a point of weakness than when we share from a point of strength. The first founders of Alcoholics Anonymous realized that they could not help anybody stay sober by saying, we've stopped drinking. We have it all together now. We can help you. But they could help people stay sober when they said, we are alcoholics just like you. And in our weakness, we need each other to stay sober. When we can share our weakness, we open the door to finding our shared strength. We've all made mistakes in our human relationships. And sometimes I think that ministers are particularly gifted at disappointing people. Maybe it's just because we have so many opportunities. But I have found that sometimes, and I can't go into detail because pastoral care situations, for one thing, are confidential, and for another thing, when we fail in those ways, it cuts too deep to the bone to find it easy to talk about publicly. But there have been several times in my ministry when I have really gotten it wrong and have been certain that my error had put the situation beyond repair. And then something remarkable happened. My mistake and my resulting remorse over that mistake allowed the other person to experience someone making a mistake, admitting the mistake, apologizing for it, and asking forgiveness, which then allowed them to offer forgiveness, which is a very powerful thing to do. And on several occasions, the situation turned out to be transforming for both of us. And a relationship that I thought was beyond repair instead went to a deeper level than it could have done without that whole interaction that began 
in my really messing up. I'm not saying we should do that on purpose in order to provide these opportunities for growth. The, the good news is we don't have to do it on purpose. <laughs> We're going to do it anyway. The last two lines of the reading this morning said, excellence is journey, perfection is destination. We tend to think often of a journey being inseparable from its destination. We journey in order to get somewhere. But the word journey originally simply meant the distance traveled in one day. That word jour, the French word for day, jour is the beginning of journey. I assume that's also the Latin root. So a journey is simply how far you go in one day. It has nothing to do with where you're trying to get to or how much further you might have to go the next day. It's just a day's travel. Joseph Campbell said that when you're on a journey and the end keeps getting further and further away, then you realize that the real end is the journey. So if we think of our lives as journeys, as pilgrimages, if you will, then the goal isn't to arrive at some perfect point. The goal is to travel as well as possible along the way. Confucius said it doesn't matter how slowly you go as long as you don't stop. And Mother Teresa is credited with saying we are not called to be successful. We are called to be faithful. To keep going, to be faithful, implies that we should keep learning and growing and improving. But it doesn't ask us to achieve perfection. Now, I often talk sermons over with friends while they're percolating. And in talking this one over, I had a friend ask me, OK, so having thought about all this, have you made any resolutions? Are you managing to accept your imperfections while still trying to determine the places in your life that might need some adjustment? Are you paying more attention to your journey and trying to journey well? And I had to stop and think because it's much easier to be theoretical about these things for your benefit than it is to apply them to one's own life, of course. And I realized that my answer had to be, no, not yet. And I find that every time I circle back around to this topic, which is one that I come back to again and again, I have a different life experience that reminds me just how far I am from achieving what I'm trying to achieve. And this year, it's the fact that in December, my very dear stepfather died. Uh, been married to my mother for 29 years. And I am now walking with my mother through the journey of figuring out how to handle everything. As with many couples of their generation, he had handled much of what had to be handled, and suddenly he's not there to handle it, and we're figuring everything out, and the legal, and the financial, and the logistical things of getting the house on the market, and her ready to move up with my sister, and there's just so much of it, as any of you who've walked this path know. And I have been in a state of extraordinary anxiety, worrying I'm going to do something wrong. And my spouse has gently tried to point out to me that, of course, I'm going to do something wrong. And whatever it is, it won't be irrevocable. If I do something wrong, I can fix it. If we lose some important paperwork, it can be reissued. That none of these things are make or break and that I am not going to be the perfect daughter getting every step perfect on this journey that my mother is now on. And I get that up here, and I have a very hard time taking it in down here. So I've got the theory, but I'm a long way from being truly comfortable with the process. Even though I know the most important thing to be doing right now is journeying well with my mother. I'm still likely to expect perfection of myself and then when I don't achieve it, to feel defeated. I'm still likely then to make resolutions that start from assuming that there's something wrong with me and then trying to fix it. 
So I think the first step in really trying to internalize this is as simple as self-awareness. That we need to begin by knowing ourselves as deeply and as honestly as possible. And that means acknowledging the broken places, the blind spots, the imperfections, the flaws. And as most of you know when you're dealing with family systems, all of those things come leaping up to greet you. You don't have to look very hard to find them. And that's never comfortable, but take heart because the process of getting to know ourselves deeply and honestly also includes recognizing the gifts and the strengths and the beauties within us that we're often too embarrassed to notice or acknowledge or that we take for granted because if we can do it, oh gee, anybody must be able to do that. And we forget to notice that it's something that's a true gift of ours. If we can open ourselves up fully to all of that, the stuff we like and the stuff we don't like so much, and get a really clear picture of who we really are, not who we think we are when we're at our most self-critical, not who we think we should be, just who we really are, then we can begin to sense when there's a genuine conflict going on internally between who we are meant to be, who we long to be, and who we're being in the moment. But the important phrase there is who we're really meant to be. So often, trying to be perfect causes us to try to be someone else, someone different than the person we're really meant to be. Instead of trying to be ourselves in the fullest and healthiest way possible. Martin Buber tells the story of Rabbi Zusia, who was nearing the end of his life and his students were asking him if he was, he, he, he was anxious about dying and his students were saying, but you've done all these wonderful things, you know, you were, you were as, as faithful as Moses and, you know, comparing to him all these great people and, and he said to his disciples, in the coming world they will not ask me why were you not Moses, they will ask me why were you not Zeusia and then what will I say? So for this year I resolve simply to be myself, which sounds so simple but isn't as simple as it sounds. It means I stop asking myself, why were you not Carl Scovel or any other minister that I particularly admire? And ask myself instead, why were you not Libby in that moment? Why weren't you more of who you could be? On my bad days, of course, I can't imagine that ever being good enough. But on my good days, I know that for me, the universe was made even though I'm not perfect. So a new year stands before us. Let's make the most of it and of ourselves.